Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name's Ruth Maguire. I'm the MSP for Cunningham South and the co-convener of the Cross Party Group on Commercial Sexual Exploitation. Um, the Cross Party Group works to end commercial sexual exploitation in Scotland. Now, prostitution is an activity that takes place behind closed doors and we rarely hear the stories of those most involved. Today we bring into public space the words of those who sell, buy and profit from prostitution. We have a panel of frontline service providers and a prostitution survivor to discuss the reality of commercial sexual exploitation and the role played in the industry um, with the proliferation of pimping websites and the impact they have. Um, we're deeply grateful to um, the women who gave their testimonies for us to use today and thank Nordic Model Now and the Women's Support Project for access to their resources. Some of what's said today will be hard to hear and there is support available. We're going to offer a short presentation before our panel discussion begins. In this recital, you'll hear the authentic words of those involved in prostitution, from those selling sex taken from survivors' testimonies, and from those buying sex taken from the comments on punter websites. These are commercial internet sites where buyers can write comments on the women they have purchased to review her performance. I'll be your narrator today, guiding you through this collection of excerpts. The quotations will be read by volunteers representing ordinary people, women who get caught up in the sex trade and men who choose to exploit. Nothing that they say is fictionalised. Anne, Jackie, Teresa and Jackie will speak the voices of our sellers and Chris, Steve and Brian will speak the voices of our punters. You'll have cards on your table. You may have come with questions. Please feel free to write them down. You might have questions after the presentation. At various points, we'll gather these in and put them to the panel. If we run out of time, what we'll do is answer those questions and put them on the Cross Party Group's website. Those who accept, tolerate um, and promote prostitution will use many um, justifications for it. Some say the world's oldest profession is just that, a profession like any other. They say that authorities have tried to ban the sex trade for millennia, but prostitution thrives in the internet age. They say it's time to face up to the reality that sex work is not going to go away. And if we treat it as just another service industry, sex workers can come out of the shadows and start to shed the stigma of criminality. We're also told that what consenting adults do behind closed doors, whether they pay for it or not, is no concern of the state. If prostitution is the oldest profession in the world, then punting is the oldest consumer activity. I wonder how does a woman begin this journey? I had no money, so someone I knew took me to a place where I could make money, and it kind of started from there. I needed money to give to my mum for my wee one, and prostitution was the easiest option. The way it was described to me, it was easy, easy money. Yeah, it'd be easy, and it wasn't. I wasn't prepared. I had no idea what I was walking into. I was born on a farm. The abuse was almost daily every conceivable type of abuse. By the time I was 11 years old, I tried to end my life, but failed. At 16, when I was legally able, I left home and headed north. Not knowing a soul, I slept with men for food and a bed. Any option was better than going home. I punt because I love slim, pretty young girls. And at my age, there is no chance of meeting those types of girls in my normal life. I punt because I like young, pretty girls who are young enough to be my daughter, or in some cases, my granddaughter. I traveled to see Sinead. Pfft, who wouldn't, size six? 18 years old. See, I was a prostitute for 10 years. Well, about that long. 10 long bloody years. 
I thought I'd be doing it for a couple of months to get us over a rough patch. I lost my job, see. There was big layoffs and I was one of the first to go. My man, see, he'd already got hurt at work, so he was off on the sick for ages. That was a bad time. Aye, that was all tough. Some of them on Punter Talk talk about women like they're a commodity. That's true. I don't think it makes any difference. As long as you treat the lady well, at the end of the day, it's just business. Women in prostitution often don't have a choice. We need other options, alternatives. Punters do have a choice. No one, no emergency, forces them to buy us and abuse us. I'm really not sure why there's such an emphasis on um, respect. When I visit a lady, respect is just about the last thing in my mind. Where to start? Well, let's begin by reading a genuine advert. Discreet Glasgow escorts. Are you attractive, intelligent, and provide 100% service every time? Preferably students. Are you looking for a friendly escort? Part-time available. Are you reliable and punctual? Part-time available. Do you want to make money, a lot of money? We provide food to eat and living conditions slash bedrooms. Are you aged between 18 and 35? Any size, but not obese or overweight and take great care of your appearance. Contact us via phone or text. It will be easy and fast. I can scan an agency <laughs> website just as I do a Chinese takeaway menu and say, yes, I'll have that tonight. Is sex work real work? If real work is having a 70-year-old drunk man bargaining with your price because you won't continue without a condom, that man getting aggressive and asking for his money back, if work is being forced to give up 50 to 100% of your income to a pimp, if work is being forced to have sex with men on the run from police for domestic abuse, if work is being filmed without your consent, if work is being slapped, beaten, told you're a worthless whore, then yes, it's work. The question shouldn't be why pay for sex, it should be why not pay for sex? We pay for lots of things in life. Sex is just another commodity. Prostitution, if it is anything, is the choice between homelessness and having men we don't like do things we hate to bodies we really don't know how to love. As much as I want to get out of this, I can't, because I can't afford to, because I've got all these bills that I have to pay. The reality of this is that if I don't do this work, I'm going to end up homeless. I'm going to end up with no money. And I'm going to end up not being able to feed my kids. Then women are meant to choose. Many of these adverts are online and we'd like menu cards. Asian escorts means girls are from one of the Asian countries like Japan, China, India, Thailand, Korea. Here's one. We're proud to represent Akira, one of our favourite escorts. Services she is providing. Girlfriend experience, oral without condom, French kiss, water sports, common mouth, 69, massage. Of course, the adverts all say these very young women are independent. I visited a Japanese girl. Uh, she was not quite right. Something during the visit, she just uh, showed me a piece of paper with I have no choice written several times on it. The question is, is she free or is she held, unable to get away by criminals who are using her? The first time I felt bad about the whole punting experience, very much the dark side of punting, as it's sometimes described in the papers, not recommended unless you want to ask some real hard questions about yourself afterwards. He still used her. 
The entrance door to the flat was double locked and a minder, the pimp, kept the key. Definitely a fire hazard and a maid would be preferable. I would only return for a different girl and preferably without the muscle. The door locks are dangerous and illegal. The final nail in the coffin of this visit was to find the security guard standing outside the bedroom door waiting for me when I left. He still used her. A tiny Singaporean turned out to be the most unresponsive girl I've ever punted with. She didn't so much recoil from my touch as freeze rooted to the spot. So I just let her plow on with the uh, sex for which I'd paid. I thought doggy would be the way to go. The added bonus being that I didn't have to look at her so sulky expression that way. She really hates this job and she's happy to tell you. Johns don't give a fuck if you're over 18 or not. In fact, many prefer if you're not. Only give a fuck if you were trafficked or if you were tricked or groomed into the industry or if it was your own idea or whether you put on an optimistic pair of rose-tinted glasses. They treat us all the same. Like we're nothing. Like they own us. Like we exist to serve them. Like we exist as receptacles for their bodies and their perversions. Like we exist as punching bags. A safe target for them to take out all their aggression and problems on. Because we are nothing. Because we can't do nothing. And because often no one else gives a shit about us either. Cold, clinical, unfriendly and to be avoided. I hope they send her back to Romania. <laughs> when I asked for a bit of participation on her part, she said, my legs are open, isn't that enough? It's common for people to think that men who buy sex can't get it at home. I have a good sex life at home, so I only pump for variety. Sometimes I want something quick and sleazy in a parlour, getting a hand job or a blow job, while the wife's shopping and you have a few minutes to spare before you meet up and take her home. A man, often married with children, can rent out a woman, have no concern or interest in why she's having to have sex for money or where she comes from. He can be capable of obtaining sexual gratification knowing the extremely high likelihood that she's only getting through it or even suffering through it and then go home and pretend as though it never happened. Men go to prostitutes to cheat without getting caught. The Johns were everyday men. They almost never looked like crazy men or stereotypical paedophiles. They worked normal jobs. They were perfectly normal. It still shocks me how well adjusted these men were. These men who paid to have sex with a child. They didn't look like paedophiles, except when they were with me. When they entered the room or wherever I was, they took off their masks. And when they were finished raping me, they put on the mask again. They didn't walk out as the paedophile rapists that they were, but as businessmen, janitors, fathers, churchgoers, husbands, or whoever they were, by that day. I can remember the last time I had sex with my wife. It was over a year ago. Using sports sessions and outings with friends as false alibis, I've attempted to keep my trips to the brothel a secret from her, although I am paranoid that she has her suspicions. It's my greatest fear that she would find out for certain. It's a bit of a myth when you think about it that those who sell sex can spot a bad punter from a good one. He was rough, too rough. 
I didn't care that I said I didn't do certain services. He wouldn't stop. He didn't stop. I always thought I would fight back. Everything stood still and I couldn't move. He left when he was finished, walked out and left me there. He left money though. I saw the other two bookings that night after him. I didn't know, I, d I don't know how I did it, but I did. I went home and I cried all night. I still do sometimes. I haven't talked about it much to anyone. No one, really. I told the agency the next day about what he'd done. They pretended to be concerned, but they didn't really care. They got their money and they said he'd be on a blacklist. He didn't. I heard later about other girls he did that to as well. I was out and a young boy approached me. He was about 19 or 20. He never had a car, so we went to a place that he'd picked. I was feeling that he was wasting my time. As I went to leave, he offered me money for my bra. Now, I know that might seem quite strange, but it's not an uncommon thing to happen. I gave him my bra and he gave me money. From that second, he just turned on me, putting the bra around my neck and really viciously beating me and strangling me. I was fighting for my life with him, really fighting for my life. Another advert. A man hires an escort. He wants to have some amazing sex and there ends the matter. But the escort makes him feel every penny is worth it. The same cannot be said about a girlfriend. And even after spending hours with her lying naked in the bed, one might get lucky if they get a blowjob. I really don't think she enjoys this job. It makes you feel a proper perp shagging a dead body who won't stop looking away. Her demeanour and her service was just too shoddy. Gave me a thoroughly uninterested blowjob. Every now and then she'd come up for air and move her jaw from side to side, rubbing her face and scowling. I asked if she licked balls, whereby she reacted as if to feign being sick and said no. By this point, her obvious desire to end the encounter had pissed me off totally. She proceeded to tell me an extremely sad personal tale. She looked like she was going to cry, but soldiered on. I felt like crap. She looked as if I was abusing the poor girl. I came, momentarily, she let some emotion pass over her face and then returned to her scowl. I got dressed and left, thoroughly upset and feeling cheated, a bastard and the lowest of the low. Girls like this should not be working. This is precisely why the industry needs regulating and some sort of customer protection needs to be introduced. I'm also thoroughly annoyed. I needed cheering up because my life has taken a real crap dive of late, but heaven only succeeded in making me feel worse. She was about 26, maybe only 19, but the tough life aged her prematurely and once her clothes were off, it went downhill. Saggy tits due to a child, painfully thin, with bruises. He still abused her. It's just a business transaction to me. I don't worry about how the checkout girl in Tesco's got to be in that job. Couldn't care less. Same goes for girls that I see in parlours or on the streets or on holiday. They're selling a service and I'm buying and that's it. Small, anorexic looking, drugged up blonde. No tits at all. And a tall, skinny, drugged up brunette. Both hideous 
and spaced out. He still used them. If women didn't want to do it anymore, they can leave, surely. There are so many barriers to leaving and staying out. A lot of the time it's like, do you know what? I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place and I can't get out of this. Since leaving prostitution, I've struggled with chronic depression, flashbacks, anorexia, and self-harm. I haven't been off psychiatric medication or out of therapy. I've never been able to enjoy sex in a loving relationship. The sex industry has robbed me of all these things. There were a few slips back into it, as it isn't easy to leave, and you get used to it. I've been away from it now since 2002. So, all prostitutes reading this, I know it's hard, but it can be done. I still consider myself a recovering prostitute. I can't deny my past, as the lessons of it have made me who I am. I do feel guilty about doing it. I just feel it's bad emotionally for women. I mean, she doesn't seem depressed, but I don't know. Maybe it's an act. I mean, I sometimes think it's just one more person at the end of the day, and I do treat escorts better than a lot of other customers do. We're coming to the end of that short presentation. There are so many stories and each one involves a person, a human, caught up in some sort of crisis. I'm going to give our last voice the, the final say, and I think this is the right place to hear her in the building of our Scottish Parliament. We've just heard the voices of those most affected by prostitution the women themselves. And we've also heard the voices of a group nearly always absent in these discussions. The men who buy them and create the demand. It is right these voices are heard, and it is right these voices are heard here, a place of power, a place where truth once known must result in action action to help those exploited and to hold those causing harm to account. I am honoured to add my real voice in person here with you today as a survivor of prostitution and trafficking. What you've just heard is not easy to hear and it's natural for us to want to turn away. I appreciate so much that you have chosen to come here today and turn toward the realities of prostitution here in Scotland. I look forward to joining our panel and sharing with you some of my lived experience. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. I'd like to join me in thanking our volunteers there. going to take a uh, um, couple of minutes and give you the opportunity to jot down any thoughts or, or questions that you have in the cards and then Lynn at the back if you hold it up we'll collect them in just a couple of minutes before we start our, our panel discussion.
some people still scribbling away for this event and other and other resources. Okay, I think what we'll do is make a start on the next section. If you have your card, Lynn will keep an eye out and if you, if you give her a wave, she'll, she'll collect it and we'll, we'll pick it up. Um, as I said when we started, we have a panel um, discussion now and I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker. Um, Linda Thompson um, coordinates the National Network for Services supporting those in the sex industry and sits on national working groups, including child and adult sexual exploitation. She's managed award-winning multidisciplinary sexual health team and led national HIV programmes with gay men developing new approaches to education. We're very pleased to have her with us today. Linda. Thanks, Ruth, for that introduction. And thanks to the cross-party group for organising today and for asking, inviting me to be part of the panel. Thanks to the organisers of the Festival of Politics, it's all been incredibly smooth so far. I hope it continues that way. As Diane said, thanks to you as audience members for coming today. But most of all, I want my thanks to be given to the women whose voices were used today. I've been with the Women's Support Project for 14 years, and during that time, I have managed the CSE Aware Practitioner Network. I've also been linked with and coordinated the Encompass Network that brings together a network of frontline services across Scotland. I've managed the Click project, developed resources like Money and Power, but most of all, and the most important part of my work, I would say, is the participation work I've led on directly with women. And some of those women's voices were included today. And you will have heard them in some of those speaks, speeches. And I led on the Inside Outside project. And it was very emotional for me, actually, to hear some of the women that I worked with and worked very closely over the years, hearing their voices here in the Scottish Parliament today. I led on the Inside Outside project and the Outside project to give a safe space for women who were involved to tell their stories, where they didn't have to out themselves, they didn't have to place an identity on themselves, but it was this opportunity in a safe way to have those conversations to articulate their realities. They were an incredible bunch of women. And I am certainly not suggesting that any of those women are weak, that they're victims, that they're hapless, that they don't have skills in their life. Because the women I have worked with over the past 14 years have been some of the most incredible women I have ever met. The strongest, most determined, resilient, resourceful women. Yes, they were women who had violence enacted on them. But I wanted to be really clear in our thoughts as we start today that we are not presenting these women as victims, hapless victims with no skills and qualities. They are strong women as the other women were included. So we've heard from the women, we've heard from the men, and what I want to focus on in my input is actually focusing on the industry, the sex industry in Scotland, and to set a spotlight on it and put it into the wider context and the wider debates in our society and our culture. And I think it's fair and fit and proper that the sex industry comes under scrutiny. But I've only got about 10 minutes, and I know that Ruth McGuire is keeping a beady eye on me in case I go over time. So I can't hope to cover it all today. But what I do want to say is that the sex industry is founded on a variety of inequalities. And it is reliant on exploitation of vulnerabilities. And it has an impact, not just on those involved, but on our wider culture. And that's what I want to highlight today. We know that the sex industry relies on a number of factors to be successful. It needs sellers, it needs the demand and buyers, and it needs a culture in which there's an attitude that is accepting of the existence of the sex industry. And as in gender, our leading gender equality organisation said in 2015, that various parts of the system of prostitution and the sex industry relies on a cultural acceptance and a centrality, focusing at the centre, that men's desires and expectations are at the fore. And it also relies on a relative impunity in which all forms of violence against women can be enacted, and where men currently are not held accountable. We know that domestic abuse rates are <coughs> rocketing. We know that levels of sexual violence are rocketing, and not all men are held accountable. So as Engender says, 
Prostitution and the sex industry is at absolutely at the nexus of inequality. If we're thinking about the sex industry, we have heard about the sellers. But I want to make an important point to this stage of today. We are not saying that the voices you have heard are all of the voices in the sex industry. Far from it. But we have to recognise <coughs> the inequality in how those voices are heard. Ray Story, a survivor of prostitution, said that we have to acknowledge that traumatised, marginalised women who are being sold in Viva Street and Gumtree and middle class white escorts, that they have equally the same potential for their stories to be heard. However, the reality is that the opportunities for those voices to be heard by the public, those opportunities for those voices to be foregrounded and have a balanced equal representation in the media and the social media and the infrastructure that basically entitles and privileges powerful voices within the sex industry, it's incredibly naive to think that these two voices get an equal place. We've done a short scoping in 2017 of the media over 10 years. And what we found is the voices of women who have been abused and been exploited in the sex industry were basically about 10% of the media coverage in Scotland. 90% was given over to other voices. So we have to acknowledge where public opinion is formed is not always based on the reality of all of the women. And we need to think about who the sellers are and acknowledge the vast majority of sellers are women and girls. That is the reality. And to deny that denies the actual underpinning gender inequality in this industry. We know there's an overrepresentation of marginalised groups, an overrepresentation across the world of indigenous women, migrant women, women who have no recourse to public funds, women from ethnic minorities, trans women, women in poverty, women in domestic abuse, homeless women, women with substance misuse problems, women with mental health problems. That's the overrepresentation within this industry. That is based on inequality. It needs inequality in order to have the supply. Absolutely, there are some women who will sell sex, who will say that it's a pleasurable and lucrative career, that it's a therapeutic vocation. No one is denying that reality. But there's also women who are trafficked, who are forced, who are co-opted, who are basically um, forced to be into this industry. Absolutely. But what about the substantial proportion in the middle? Marianne Hester done research in 2019, and it's this bell jar in the middle of women. And where are they? Where are they placed? Where's their realities coming free? Why do they need to sell sex? The substantial proportion of them are there because of finances. And why because of finances? Well, it's based on wider gender inequality and gendered structural inequalities that put constraints in women's lives and reduce their options. The industry relies on it. So we have to focus on this group in the middle and we have to take a step back and we have to look at the bigger factors, the structural factors, the socio-economic factors that push women into it. And we have to critique this industry. It is only right and proper that we critique this industry and the place in which it has in our culture. And it move, we have to move beyond individual choice. We have to move on beyond that because we have to consider how choices are narrowed or have no choice at all for women. We have to look at the bigger picture. And as Engender said, that we can acknowledge the agency of individual women, but we also can critique the industry and critique the gendered structures that underpin it and the impact it has on our culture. Women's Aid acknowledges in Scotland how entry into the sex industry is grounded in inequality and exploitation and how their entry is inexplicably linked to poverty, discrimination and disadvantage. And the persistence of these inequalities mean that any concept of free and consensual choice must be balanced within that wider culture and the inequalities and the constraints put on women. And if we think about this industry and an exploiting vulnerability, well, what are the other vulnerabilities apart from the systemic inequality that women live with? We know that women within this industry um, come from poverty, women who have had adverse experiences in their childhood, backgrounds of abuse, mental health issues and addiction. And to deny that is to deny the reality of the vast majority of this industry. And we have to think about the vulnerabilities in the current context. We know that COVID had a huge impact on women who were involved in selling or exchanging sex. It was devastating for them. They had no social supports, they did not have money, they had to make incredibly difficult choices in order to survive. And men and the industry was well aware of this. We done a scope and we found 1,600 adverts for men placed during COVID that were absolutely about exploiting vulnerability. 
Any single mums out there struggling with lockdown and coronavirus? I've got £500. Any desperate and cheap women in adverts placed? Condom free sex is preferred by me. Students and single mums welcome. If you fancy getting pregnant, that's an added bonus. If you're already pregnant, that's cool with me too. So the cynical explo exploitation of vulnerability that arose during COVID. Post-COVID, we still are dealing with the impacts that are pushing women. We have rising unemployment that creates vulnerability. We have women in poverty. What is the estimate that 40% of our children are going to be in poverty within the next four or five years? 40% of children, that means that we have women in poverty. We know that women have massive debts. We know that women are having to turn to loan sharks. In fact, a piece of research was done with people who had entered into contracts with loan sharks. 10% of the women were forced to sign a contract that said that they would sell sex if they defaulted on their loan repayment. The equivalent did not happen to any men. Women are living with rising pressures from living costs. Let's not even get into the energy crisis and what that is going to mean over this winter, next winter, and the following winter. All of these create vulnerabilities. And we need to look at the vulnerabilities for the high percentage of migrant women that are involved in the sex industry, are pushed into the sex industry through things like no recourse to public funds. We have all seen the attention in the media about the vulnerability of Ukrainian women being trafficked en route or ending up in the sex industry. That is the reality. This industry relies on vulnerability. It has changed over time, primarily driven by the explosion um, of the internet. It is now a highly globalized and highly industrialized industry. And to deny it and say that the industry is made up of independent women denies the reality of the vast majority in the middle. In 2012, Foundation Chasselles estimated that we had around 40 to 42 million people, women, worldwide who were involved in prostitution. Highly globalized and industrialized phenomenon. There's estimates that prostitution brings in 186 billion pounds per year globally. In fact, in 2014, the Office of National Statistics estimated that in Britain, United Kingdom, it was 5.6 billion. So it's highly industrialized, highly profitable. Government themselves benefit from them. 1 billion euros per year is taken in by the Dutch government in taxes. In Thailand, the gross domestic product, 14%, is based on the exploitation of women and children. It is industrialised, it is accepted, it is normalised in our culture. And if we think within Scotland, who benefits? Sauna owners, escort managers, the respectable face of the sex industry, the licensed promises, promises that operate in our capital city. Margaret Patterson, a very well-known escort manager. She was found to have four, almost half a million pounds worth of designer goods in her house. In her bank account, she had over half a million. She had 200,000 pounds sitting in cash. I know the women who worked with Margaret. They had nothing that reflected that. So there's a huge amount of profit to be made. And where there's a huge amount of profit to be made, then you will have people who will enter into and start controlling this industry. And again, to deny it denies reality. We know there is links with the sex industry and organized crime. Organized crime that frequently trafficked women into prostitution, but also provides the support, the protection, the liaison and services to pimps, brothel owners and other groups. And their involvement, of organised crime is essential to this industry and to deny it in Scotland is to deny the women's realities. In Germany, under a regulated system, Jürgen Rudolf, who was known as the brothel king, has been criminalised and convicted for five years. For why? Because he was involved in human trafficking. That is within the regulated industry. It is still underpinned by human trafficking and links to organised crime. In New Zealand, that has a decriminalised system, Research has shown that there's still extensive links between organised crime and the sex industry. The two go hand in hand. In the United Kingdom, the all-party parliamentary group on prostitution in its inquiry found that sexual exploitation was involved with organised crime. So if we think about this industry, we have to think of the connections with it. And in Scotland, our serious and organised crime strategy recognises the links in this country. Drugs primarily is the most profitable form for organised crime, however they've diversified into prostitution. And as Detective Superintendent Phil Capaldi said, whenever there's money to be made, they will diversify. And what have they diversified into? The selling and exchanging of women within this industry. And women I've worked with know well the links with organised crime. The women in this bell jar in the middle, they know them. Barbie that I worked with, 
She talked about being, organized, being involved with gangsters and organized crime and how they were pushing independent women out of the industry to take them over. Natasha, who was trafficked into this country, I spoke to her about legislative models and about removing, um, decriminalizing um, brothel keeping, pimping. And she said, oh my God, really? Who? Who asks for that? Pimping to be legal? Oh my God. I think if that happens, you will see an explosion of the industry like every other house will be an escort house. That's going to bring many more pimps to Scotland. It won't be safe for all the independent girls because they won't allow them to sell sex without them being involved. If there's too many girls in the city, the pimps will take them home. And the independent girls, those that the pimps can't control, they'll be made to leave. Do these people understand who they are involved with? That's the reality of the sex industry in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Diane, in another context, <coughs> has clearly made the links and talked about the links between organised crime, trafficking and these commercial websites, the industrial, the acceptable face of the sex industry. We know that there's a huge growth in human trafficking and Excuse me, we know that there's been an exponential increase in the adverts online. So we have to start confront this industry. Police Scotland identified the links between human trafficking, and exploitation and online websites. Phil Capaldi again, that he said that organised crime isn't hidden and it's not underground. Through the sex industry, they're there in plain sight and we have to start to challenge it. We have to take a step back and we have to look at the role and the impact of the sex industry in our popular culture. Liz Kelly, Maddie Coy, I'm sure many of you will be aware of them, they talk about the creation of a conducive culture, a conducive culture for violence against women, and we have to start thinking about what is the role of this industry in creating that conducive culture. Violence against women has been connected with beliefs and attitudes that men are entitled to sexual access to women, that they are superior, and somehow they're entitled to be sexual aggressors. We have to look at the role of the sex industry in dehumanising and objectifying women, where they're made a thing for others' use. And like it or not, having a market of women, whether they're selling sex or being commodified in whatever way, it does objectify and it does dehumanise women. And it affects all women in terms of how they're perceived. We've seen a rise in collector culture with men and young men, <coughs> excuse me, looking not just for images of women in the sex industry, but women in their own community in order to create their own albums and these albums in a way that can be shared with other men. We have to look at how prostitution creates the environment. And we have to ask simple and difficult questions. One survivor said, women shouldn't have to have sex with men that they don't want to have sex with. What happened to all the work that we do on consent? A survivor that I have worked with said, the bottom line is, Linda, we're never going to get gender equality whilst men can buy women. So what's to be done? We have to draw a line in the sand and we have to look to change men's attitudes. We have to look to disrupt this industry and we have to place accountability for the cost and the harm that is caused with those who do it. Women's rights to safety must always take precedence over men's rights to consume. So what are we going to do? Well, I don't agree with our former Justice Secretary, Kenny McCaskill, when he said, when he was asked what was to be done, he said, well, what's to be done? Maybe sometimes looking the other way is the best option. Laws can't provide answers to deep-rooted social problems. I agree legislation is not the only aspect that we need in our arsenal and our toolkit to address this. But I would reaffirm, and I would agree with Audrey Morrison, a survivor of trafficking, who set up an organisation and supports many other women involved in trafficking. And what she has said is that, well, we can't turn a blind eye to the kids and vulnerable adults who are chewed up and spit out by this industry. That's who I fight for. And that's who I also fight for. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. That was wonderful. Um, our next speaker is Michael Conroy. Michael founded Men at Work, a community interest company delivering training for professionals who are supporting the personal development of boys and young men, challenging sexism and fostering violence-free relationships. Michael's spoken at national education conferences and in the um, Westminster Parliament and designed and co-sponsored a global conference on porn versus effective sex education. Michael, you're very welcome. Thanks, Thanks for Thanks very us. much. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very honoured and surprised to be here. And uh, 
very nervous following Linda. <laughs> so luckily I'm not going to cover much of the same topic because you just delivered that with such lucidity I, I would have nothing to add. Um, and luckily the little bit that I'm going to be talking about, and please do tell me when it's time to stop, is about... Um, we, we've heard from men's voices, the punters, the Johns, whatever you want to call um, them. Um, but what about boys? This is the question that I just want to pose. A really simple question, but sometimes with simple questions, they're really difficult. They're really difficult. And what I'd like to do is give you 30 seconds at least of, of this eight or nine minutes to ponder this question. You've got a room full of 14-year-old, 15-year-old boys. They're on the verge of manhood. They are dipping into the social currents and scripts. They may have been exposed to them to various degrees around. What are women for? What are girls for? What are men? What are we supposed to be? How are we supposed to act? You've got a room full. You might be talking to them for an hour. What would you say to them? about buying access to women's bodies. Don't need a quick answer, just need 30 seconds maybe to consider the discomfort of that thought and the fact that nobody is doing that work. Almost nobody is doing that work. It's just let flow. Okay, Sarah, Sarah. They will find what they want or they will find what is given to them they will believe what they're being told. I work with, I've worked for several years, many years in fact, with teenage boys in England who believe that all women on OnlyFans get about 10 grand a week and that some of them are multimillionaires within a month because they've read an article about it and it got shared. They believe it. But it's weird what we believe, isn't it? Because we believe things that somehow don't cause us discomfort. We believe things that are comforting. And that's a really interesting thing to do, is to talk to boys and young men about what they are choosing to believe and therefore what they're choosing to ignore. Because soon there will be adult men, 14, 15, 16, big bodies, adult bodies, with money, Believe in scripts. What is the script for, for being a man? Hundreds and hundreds of lads that I've worked with. Be tough, be dominant, get the last word, have money power, have a load of sex. Tell people about the sex you're having, otherwise people will think you're a virgin. That's shameful. Not having sex, shameful. They might think you're gay, shameful. This script of misogynistic homophobia spiralling around everywhere they look online, unfiltered, making billions for someone. It's always money. <laughs> always follow the money. Where does it go? Very rarely in the pockets of individuals. The role of organised crime and prostitution, you know way better than I do. But to think that it is not, why would you? Why wouldn't you? There's so much easy money to make for the pimps. I was thinking about this weather, this extraordinary weather. I've never, I've only been to Edinburgh three times and it pissed down every time. I slept rough one night on a golf course and I thought, it doesn't matter, it's Edinburgh, it's great. I'll have a few beers. So this is the first time I've come and it's been sunny and I'm just stunned by it, it's so gorgeous. <laughs> but. <laughs> I'm thinking, who makes, who makes profit from beautiful weather? Pubs, ice cream sellers, uh, people selling sunshine cream, sunshine hats, campsites, all of that. And I'm thinking, poverty is pimp weather. Poverty is the great weather for pimps. They make hay while the sun shines. Or in terms of poverty, while it shites. Or people are desperate, as you were talking about Ukraine. We're talking about all war zones, all war zones, all, everywhere, you know, where there is disaster, where there's a lack of genuine agency, where there is terror, where is, where am I going to sleep tonight? What am I going to eat? What am I going to feed my kids? There are always vultures, pimps. This is pimp weather, poverty. And as you say, the coming winters, 
what are they going to bring? Certainly not altruism from some quarters, just more and more need, more and more desperation, more and more 14, 15 year old boys choosing to believe because it's easy to believe and that they're encouraged to believe that if, you did, if she didn't enjoy it, she wouldn't do it. Because apparently, everything we really know about the manufacturer of consent, very good book, by the way, by Norm Chomsky, recommend a bit of a read, the manufacturer of consent, where we feel that we're doing just what we want, and that we're being wonderful kind of postmodern choosers and pickers of everything we do. It's absolute nonsense. We're subject to massive, deeply entrenched structural forces. We live in a capitalistic society, drenched with all kinds of uh, hangovers from religions, patriarchal religions. We're living in a patriarchy. We don't talk about that to boys. We should do. Not to shame them, because they're absolutely useless to shame anybody. We need to empower them, give them information, give them critical thinking skills. But fundamentally, we need to create space to develop empathy for their sisters. And I don't really think I've got a great deal else to say apart from that, really, because you've said, and will say, so much better than I will, poverty is pimp weather. And I don't think any of us want them to profit from it. But boy, they sell themselves well. Because there are hundreds of thousands of young men in Scotland and England and Wales, Northern Ireland and everywhere going online going, look at that, she made 10 grand a week. Because of course it will, the whole industry, the nexus, the, inter, the interconnected nature of that, it pushes that myth. Do we not live in a world where industries push their own myths? <coughs> Petrol industry, mining, cotton back in the day, sugar, of course they do, tobacco, of course they do. They tell us stuff which is totally false but they tell it as well and they find people who will enact their voice who seem credible. Well, let me just go back to that question. You're in a room with 13, 14, 15 year old boys. What do we say to them? Who was it who was talking about? Be a good punter, be polite, be nicer than the others. Is that it? Is that the best we can do? No, I don't believe it is. Thank you, Michael. Um, our final speaker um, before we move to questions is Diane Martin. Diane spent over 25 years supporting women to exit prostitution. She's worked with government and local authority partnerships to develop and improve strategy, policy, frontline services and exiting options. Diane is a survivor of prostitution and trafficking and was awarded a CBE for services to vulnerable women in prostitution. Diane, we're so glad you're with us. Thank Over you, to you. Ruth. Thank you. <clears throat> I hope you don't mind that I'm going to stay sitting down. I was going to stand up, but my legs are like <laughs> wobbling and shaking. My hand is as well. Um, it's not that I don't feel that anxious. I think it's just that this is just, it's just so important to me. It means so much to me. Um, that we're having an event like this and that you've, you've come today to listen and to engage. And I hope you're still with it. I know it's a lot to hear. We've heard some difficult things. But um, I really think that it's fantastic that we're hearing about some of the realities in prostitution in our parliament building here in Scotland. And we don't often hear um, what it's like. And believe me, that was completely toned down. But, you know, we didn't want to have you all carted off in an ambulance at the end. So we've, we've tried to kind of get, get a balance in terms of what we're wanting to get across. Um, I'm just going to check the time. OK. OK. <laughs> Thank you um, to my fellow panellists. Totally blown away. I like when we don't know what each other is going to say. I like when we all have the freedom to say what we want. And that often results in that we'll maybe say the same things I'll probably say things that Linda's already said, but I don't think there's any harm in re-emphasising some of these points. Um, thank you to the organisers of this event, um, to Jackie Stoyle and to our volunteers that read those words. No easy thing, especially, not especially, but for the men to actually 
come up and read those words. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, I'm just really proud of all of them. And obviously to you for coming here today. Because of where we are um, right now here in our parliament, I, I do want to start by acknowledging that our government's policy rightly recognises prostitution as violence against women and girls, and their manifesto pledges a commitment to address demand. And I do, I wasn't going to say this, but I do want to point out the necklace that I got made for today. <laughs> I thought I needed some glittery gold armour, it says end demand. Um, and you've just heard the voices of the very men who fuel that demand. But we need that recognition by government, you know, it's been around for a while, uh, to be translated into action in order to improve the lives of some of the most vulnerable and at risk in our society. Um, in my late teens, I was exploited through prostitution in London and later trafficked to a prostitution ring in the Middle East ridiculously described as high class, I was sent out by what was described then as the safest agency in London. There is nothing high class about being raped, bitten or asked at gunpoint if you want to see your mum again. The venues, sorry, <laughs> miss my mum. <laughs> the venues for me were luxury hotels, apartments and diplomatic accommodation. The punters highly educated and in positions of power. Trafficked overseas, the venues were royal palaces and homes of government ministers. It has been the privilege of my life to have spent over 25 years supporting other women to get out too. I founded a support service for women in street-based prostitution and brothels um, in London, and I mentor women who were trafficked. I have never met one woman who didn't want to leave. And yeah, I've had the honour and privilege of sitting across from hundreds and hundreds of women. Um, what I have learned from these two vantage points of personal and professional experience is that in my view, it is all the same thing. A bruise or a threat feels the same whether you're in a five-star hotel or leant up against a car park wall, whether wearing Prada or Primark. The fear, the violence and the hopelessness feels the same, as does the desire for safety and a life free of violence. Recognising prostitution in different locations as expressions of the same form of abuse is key to dismantling the suppressive and harmful system. I'm 58 years old. Uh, my combined 39 years of personal and professional experience has led me to an unwavering position of campaigning for an end demand approach to prostitution policy. And I agree with Linda that legislation can't be our, you know, our only tool, but I think you know, that it, it could do, um, it could improve things vastly. I currently chair the A Model for Scotland campaign, an alliance of survivors and organisations working to combat commercial sexual exploitation here in Scotland. We are calling for a progressive legal framework that will criminalise all forms of sex purchase, make online pimping a crime, decriminalise victims of sexual exploitation, and expunge any prostitution-related offences from their records and provide well-resourced, long-term support and exiting services. So, prostitution, sometimes referred to, certainly not by me, as sex work. Language is important, and we know that when we change the language that we use to describe things, it changes how we perceive them. It is the same with prostitution. The narrative of sex work and a job like any other does exactly that. Yes, sex acts are involved, but it is, as we've heard, unwanted sex, which means it's exploitative. Money can't buy consent, and we can't consent to our own exploitation. As for work, for those, and we've heard very eloquently from both Linda and Michael, for those with a vested interest in it, it's often presented as being about labour rights, if we could just get that right, then all would be well. But no. We see that in countries who have tried to achieve this, 
that it has been an utter failure with a very real and unacceptable human cost. What other jobs involve sexual harassment and violence in the workplace, rape, physical, emotional and psychological harm on a daily basis and a much higher than average mortality rate? Pushing an agenda of legalisation or full decriminalisation seeks to reframe the sex industry that Linda was talking about, where, peop where women are just service providers, punters are clients, and pimps and traffickers become managers and facilitators. And if it, if it is accepted as a job like any other, and policy and legislation is subsequently based on this assertion, then why would we need the support systems and exiting services that we know are needed to help women to leave and recover? Julie Bindle, the journalist and women's rights campaigner, rightly states, in my view, that the inside of a woman's body is not a workplace. And Dana Levy, an Israeli survivor of prostitution, makes the point that in areas of legitimate and what we internationally and legally describe as decent work, expertise is valued and the experienced worker can generally expect higher wages. She highlights that this is not the case in prostitution, where she says experience has no value and a lack of experience brings in more profit for pimps and traffickers where the common request from punters is about who is the youngest on offer, Sorry. who is the youngest on offer, and if they have new girls. I remember all too well being asked by punters at age 19 to pretend and say out loud to them that I was 16 years old. Look at my hand. <laughs> um, Levy also exposes the reality that even if there is a certain amount of labour and actual service, it's not a prerequisite for the deal. The minimum condition is only that you have body temperature. You could be drugged or drunk to the point of unconsciousness and you can still be sold. You might participate, but you don't have to. Your body can be used for sexual acts even without your cooperation. And if this supposed work is so empowering and lucrative, as Michael was talking about, you know, the perception of OnlyFans, we would expect to see men and women from all walks of life, education and tax brackets queuing up for their liberation and path to riches and independence. But no, we all know the reality is that you cannot reframe and sanitise abuse and exploitation. And we all already know that nobody, including those who espouse the sex workers' work mantra, wants their daughter subjected to this supposed work. It is exploitation, it cannot be made safe, health and safety cannot be applied, and where this has been attempted, it has failed miserably. And Linda mentioned Germany, and we've only to look at Germany, known as the brothel of Europe, where there are over a million sex purchases every day, and where nearly all the women being sold have been trafficked from other countries. Currently in Scotland, we are not a hostile environment for traffickers. And the legislative process that I outlined earlier, many countries have taken it on board. And it's interesting because as the United Kingdom, we are kind of sandwiched between Ireland, who have um, changed laws both in Northern Ireland and in the Republic of Ireland. And also France um, has the legislation I described, and it looks like Spain is about to implement it. So we are, you know, well, we are in Ireland, but we're an island where it's not a hostile environment for traffickers. And we know because of work that particularly the Swedish police have done, that they've, because they're allowed to intercept phone calls. We're not allowed to do that, I don't think, but they are. And they've heard traffickers you know, say, oh, we're going to pull out of Sweden, we're going to move you know, somewhere else. Prostitution is not about labour rights, but it is about human rights. And to me, the right not to be for sale. It is also highly gendered, as Linda so eloquently um, presented to us, where the overwhelming majority, forced, recruited, groomed, or trapped there by others or by desperate circumstances, are women and children, overwhelmingly poor and from already disadvantaged and marginalised groups. 
And where is the class analysis of the unequal power imbalance between the men paying for sex and the women being paid for? Prostitution relies on the acceptance of believing that a subset of women and girls, working class, poor, and in crisis being for sale, seen as objects and treated like a commodity to be consumed and discarded. And the demand re consistently requires a continual stream of new products. In prostitution, they are nearly always underlying issues that create those conditions of vulnerability. Most women and girls' routes into prostitution have been paved with these issues, including poverty, childhood sexual abuse, neglect, addiction, or coercive and controlling relationships. This is why we must rid ourselves of the false dichotomy we're so often presented with, that of course sex trafficking is bad, but prostitution is a choice and a job. It's a choice of no choice. Both rely on gender inequality and vulnerability, and both are inherently harmful. Sex buyers create this demand for a subset of women to be exploited, and it's entitled men of every social class, education and economic status, if there were no demand, there would be no supply. It's all about profit and financial gain, but not for those subjected to it. Punters continue to line the, profits, the pockets of pimps, traffickers and organised crime groups who are raking in billions off the literal backs of women and children. In Scotland, the overwhelming majority, in my opinion, would say, and actually I'd say this across the UK, are, of women in prostitution are from poorer countries or there are UK girls and women whose start in life has been made up of multiple disadvantages, then preyed on and exploited. We heard earlier real comments made by real men and although we heard their words, they are not here. But if they were here, this is what I would say to them. <coughs> to those who thought your money paid for consent, we did not want you touching us. It made our skin crawl. We do not want to touch your body. We were either faking it or past being able to fake it, and you did not care. Whether you deluded yourself by our fake smiles, our hollow sounds of pretend pleasure, or whether you saw our distress, ignored it, or was sexually gratified by it, and did what you wanted anyway. Know that our thoughts were about wondering if we would get out in one piece. And as soon as we could, we tried to scrub off all traces of you. If only we could wash off the memories just as easily. Some of us have spent years trying to do just that. In conclusion, you'll be glad to hear. Look, we're actually having a mini heat wave. And Michael's, Michael's you know, been really excited to, to actually see that we'll have sunshine in Scotland. I'm from Dundee, which is the sunniest city in Scotland. Um, you could be basking in the sun with a pint or laughing your socks off at um, an Edinburgh festival event. But you've chosen to come here to listen to these challenging truths. As a survivor of prostitution, that greatly encourages me. The festival of politics exists to encourage dialogue, participation and action. And this is the best kind of politics where working to address exploitation is cross-party work. So what kind of a Scotland do we want to see? Surely a progressive Scotland. There's nothing progressive about prostitution. We need a vision for Scotland that becomes a reality we can be proud of and that rejects the idea that a person can be for sale. Everyone can get involved and everyone is needed. I'm going to plug our website now. Please check out our website, www.amodelforscotland.org, for information on the campaign, including how you can get involved, receive newsletters and resources, and see past webinars. The more we understand the realities of prostitution together, the more we can work together for change, and we will be a better society for it because we will never have real equality between women and men while women can be for sale. Thank you for listening, and I'll hand back to Ruth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. That was great. I'm just trying to make eye contact with Lynn to get some of these in. Um, we've got some questions from earlier. If you want to, um, if, if the 
discussions have prompted any more and you want to um, hand them in, if you wave your card at Lynn, she will um, bring them. What I'm going to do is look for questions rather than thoughts at the moment. Here we go. Okay. Um, I should say as well, we probably won't, we've got 15 minutes, we won't get through all of them, but what we will do is put them all up on um, the website so that your questions and your thoughts and, and the responses from panel members or, or the group are there. So what is happening in Scotland to work with men who buy sex to help them understand the harm they're causing? Linda, I'm going to... Thank you, Ruth, <laughs> sitting that in me. Yeah. So what work is happening with men? I suppose we would... And what the Scottish Government would say is that there's prevention work happening with young men um, through schools where we have um, sessions, lesson plans, uh, programmes of work happening through the curriculum that's looking at issues around consent. Uh, certainly in the latter years there'll be um, aspects around pornography and some aspects around prostitution. And I would say that's pretty much it. We do have obviously a campaign um, called White Ribbon in Scotland, which asks men not to commit, um, collude or condone acts of violence. And they are engaged in some work, preventative work with younger men. But I would say in terms directly with work with men around prostitution, consumer, buying consent, being involved in the sex industry, it's minimal okay. direct work. Thank you. I think that follows on to the next question. So I'm just going to get through as many of these as I can. How, how do we encourage more men and boys to be involved in the discussion and take responsibility for their role? Michael, I'm going to give that one to you. Um, that's a really good question because we're, at, we're basically at the starting point. We're basically at zero for that in terms of a holistic kind of national, whether it's, you know, UK wide, Scotland wide, England wide, whatever it is, there are small amounts of programmes that are often uh, shy of prostitution. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about porn, they, but they're happy to get people to sign, get men to stand up and sign public pledges, say, I will not hit my wife or girlfriend. It's not enough. It's, it's, it's a thousand miles from enough, which is why I, I reject that kind of public pledge making. And I believe the best thing to do is to give people who work with boys and young men, whether they're youth, youth workers, social workers, family support, early help, teachers, uh, sports coaches, whoever they may be, a, a solid toolkit that they can rely on and have ongoing conversations with boys and young men that don't come at it from an immediately judgmental accusatory position, which just brings down the shutters, but which opens a, a space to have to explore the script that they're being offered over and over again, and they have been offered that since they were born, about what it means to be a man in this culture. And I think that if we don't move to that broad position where it's part of an everyday conversation, we're just not going to get anywhere. OK, thank you. Um, the next question is asking what alternatives are for women stuck in impossible positions and feel they have nowhere to turn? Um, there are places that women um, can turn, um, often operating on a shoestring budget. Uh, and but but there are you know the thing that I feel really confident about in the in the whole of the UK and, and here in Scotland is that there are some excellent projects that know how to work in the right way and know how to um, support women. Um, my own experience of, of running an exiting project, I kind of learned you have to tackle all the areas uh, in one go. <laughs> so you're having to look at health, physical health, mental health, homelessness. Um, coercive controlling relationships um, and work in a way that's really individually tailored to that woman. Um, we're not just a homogenous group even though there's a, there's a lot of obviously common threads and experiences and there, there are you know I know that women can exit prostitution because I've you know been able to, to do that and see it and implement it and see other people doing it. It is uh, it's not overnight, it's a long haul, but it's also not rocket science. And it's about um, helping people with the needs that they have, building up their self-esteem, which is usually non-existent. Um, and, but as Linda said, you know, amazingly strong, resilient uh, women that have survived what they've su survived. So there are some really good projects and there's some really good practice. And a, a lot of um, particularly women's projects have been doing this for 
you know, years and years and years. Uh, I always felt that we were about 10 years behind the kind of where we were, maybe 15 years behind where we were with domestic violence. But there is certainly hope um, uh, for women to exit and rebuild the lives that they want to choose um, for themselves. It's totally possible. Yes, there's lots of um, barriers to it. And yes, we're, you know, we're thinking about austerity, but that, you know, the, the, um, the solution to poverty is not sexual exploitation. And we can, in projects like Linda, fight and fight and advocate um, for women. And we do see women um, um, getting, out, getting out away and away from their abusers. Do you want to say a few words? Because obviously that's your... Yeah. Um, I think it's Not important to highlight that the Scottish Government um, commissioned and undertook research and some of the colleagues involved in that are sitting in the room, so I don't want to speak over them, but it flagged up that research about the gap in services across Scotland and that there isn't the comprehensive, well-funded, long-term support services available, both harm reduction for whilst women are involved, but also whenever women choose to move on, that those services are available. So I think it's important to flag that we have a gap, but that I think what we do know, and if we've listened to women themselves, and the women I worked with in the Outside Project, they clearly talked about what do they need to be put in place in order to have an alternative. And very often that was a practical step. And I will always think of Barbie, and she talked about that you need a concrete step on that ladder in order to exit. But I think there's something as a little step further back on that. And one thing that came out through the recent research that the Scottish Government also commissioned that looked at women's lived experience, that women said that they wanted people to talk to them about this. So actually, if they were accessing mental health services, if they were accessing housing and homelessness, if they were ac accessing addictions, whatever, primary care, medical care, actually women do want to be asked, are you involved? And whenever you open that conversation, then you create the space where the woman can start to look at where's her opportunities and what's her vision for her future. So I think we, we have to move. Uh, it's absolutely acknowledging the role of specialist services to support women to exit. But I think there has to be a wider call to action that actually everybody needs to step up their game and create the spaces that women can talk about this, but also create the spaces and the practical, tangible steps that help women move on as and when they want to. Thank you. This next question, I know, I know that some of it has been covered, but I think it's, it's maybe worthwhile um, giving it a, a concise answer as well. What would, you, <laughs> what would you say to those who say sex work is work and deregulation will make it safe for some sellers? You, you've said the word concise and looked at me. <laughs> well, um, in hope. Right, yes, well, in yeah. hope, have hope. Um, but they've said it's... I think you covered in your um, presentation about other countries where... Yeah. There's been deregulation. De this questioner is asking, um, what do you say to those who say sex work is work and deregulation will make it safe for the sellers? Right, it, it doesn't make it safe. And actually, some of the, the criticism of the what I would like to see in place, um, this about, it's often termed the Nordic model or the equality model, um, is just mythology. They'll come up with things like saying, you know, if we, if we criminalise sex purchase, then it'll drive it underground. It won't drive it underground. <laughs> you know, the women selling sex and the, the sex buyers have to be able to, to connect. And um, we just, we just, there's just such a lot of evidence out there that shows the reality of what's happened in the countries that have adopted um, an approach that sees it as exploitative and decriminalizes the women and criminalizes the men. And where that hasn't happened, like Linda said, uh, in Germany, um, there's not much difference between legalisation and full decriminalisation. Um, it has not uh, met what the proponents of it said that it, that it would. Really, can I pick up on that as well? Yes. I think, first of all, the terminology sex work is work. Um, whenever I've been doing participation work with women, I've asked them, how would you identify what terminology would you use? In the Inside Outside project, 16 women were involved in that and not one wanted to be called a sex worker. So I think we need to be very careful about that terminology and not apply it to people who would not use it themselves. And I mean, I think it's interesting the term, what does that cover sex work? I certainly know in 2015, a pamphlet went out from an organisation in Scotland and they said that a sex worker was everybody that was involved in any element of the sex industry and that included cleaners and lap dancing clubs, pornographers, cameramen, sound men on shoots, right up to women involved in escort and street prostitution. So it's a very wide term and what does that actually mean in reality whenever it becomes so broad? And are we really saying within that terminology that somebody who's involved in selling images online, of course they have needs, 
absolutely have a voice, but are we really saying that those needs of that woman as a sex worker are the same as the needs as a woman who's involved in street prostitution for 10 years? So I think we have to unpick the terminology a little bit before we start to answer that question. And it's acknowledging, yes, absolutely, some women do identify as that. However, you know, I think we need to look at this idea about being safer, and I think we have to name who commits the violence and makes it unsafe. Mm -hmm. The violence that is enacted and committed, people don't tend to like to say that it is men, and they don't like to tend to say that it is punters. Mm -hmm. But in my experience, and the experience of the Encompass Network and other services directly involved in women, who makes it unsafe? It is the men who make it unsafe, and we clearly heard that through some of the accounts today, and I know that from the work that I do. We have to start saying who commits the acts of violence, who makes it unsafe. Yeah. Primarily, it is punters. Some people would say that's pseudo-punters, but it is men who feel entitled within those contexts. Mm -hmm. um, Hilary Connell done a really interesting piece of research. He looked at the violence that men enacted to, as punters against the women, and it primarily was down to they didn't get the service that they wanted, they didn't get the kind of sex that they wanted. They weren't able to have an erection and they weren't able to come. So who did they take that out on on the women? So I think we have to start looking at the concept of being safe and what that actually means. Mm. And if you're talking about deregulation, absolutely. In New Zealand, it has been highlighted that women feel more comfortable reporting the violence and going to the police. That's crucial. But the violence didn't stop. I'm it didn't stop the violence. And that's what we need to look to do. Just really shortly too, stigma never left a bruise on me. Um, men did, punters did, and where the stigma should be placed is um, on the sex buyers, the pimps and the traffickers. Do you have anything you want very, to Very briefly to say that um, it can never be safe because the values and beliefs of the men who, who go to find, who, who go to pay for sexual access to women, women's bodies, are inherently unsafe. That's why they do it. It's an impossibility. It's impossible. Okay. Okay. And I think this will probably be our, our final question. Um, after so many years of discussion, what needs to happen to ensure the Scottish Parliament criminalises the purchase of sex? You're the MSP. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Happy to talk about that. I just don't want to be in the final question. Let me do some talking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the government are, are working towards that. As has been said, they've recognised for decades, which is actually, I feel a bit embarrassed about that. You know, it's been there in policy that this is violence against women. It's been acknowledged, but the action hasn't been taken. There will be a, a bill that works its way through Parliament. Um, as members of the public, what you can do to help is get involved and speak to your local um, MSP. You'll have a, a constituency MSP and a list MSP. Whenever a bill works its way through Parliament, it's consulted on by the government first and then by whichever committee is scrutinising it. So there are two opportunities to, to get involved and make your, make your views known. Um, Diane very helpfully um, shared the Model for Scotland website um, with us. Can you just remind me of that again? Is it org.org? Yes. Model for Scotland. www.amodelforscotland.org. So there are, there, there's lots of more information on that about, about you know, what we're, we're, we're proposing. So I think those are the things. I think when, when the bill comes, there are, you know, there's not universal acceptance that this is the best way to make uh, women and girls safe. There are those, as you know, we've, we've heard, that, that believe decriminalising prostitution is the way to make um, women and girls safe. So there will be a debate to be had as the bill works its way through. So there'll be lots of opportunities for um, members of the public to get involved. And as an MSP and um, co-convener of the CPG, I'll certainly be doing all I can to ensure that it, that it happens. One final point that's crucial though, the, the law changing in itself it, it is not enough and it won't be yeah. enough for um, the women involved. And we have to make sure that as the bill's making its way mm -hmm. through Parliament, we do everything we can to make sure that exits um, services and support are properly um, funded. And I say, I'm not a member of government, but I am a member of the party of government. And I say that we need to push the Scottish government on that to ensure that there's proper backing there. Because just to change the law, and to end this won't make women's lives better. We need to have that whole, whole package. Yeah. So with 
two minutes left to go, can I just um, ask you to join me in thanking our panel members, um, Linda Thompson, Michael Conroy and Diane Martin very much. And I thank you all for coming. It's absolutely roasting in here. That's <laughs> amazing stamina to sit for this amount of time listening. We appreciate you being here and we'll get the answers to all these questions and pop up. There was some, some thoughts and reflections on what was said. So we'll get that up on the website as well so you can, you can share them. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Panel members. Thank you.